Okay, why don't we uh, launch? We have about something over 170 people in uh, cyberspace watching us. L let me begin by welcoming everybody. My name is Elliot Cohen. I'm the Dean of Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SICE. And uh, this is one of our regular SICE uh, fora. And uh, our, our guest at the SICE forum today is um, somebody who, for whom I have uh, very high regard, and I, I would like to be able to count as a friend, um, Ambassador Landa Nuseba, the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to uh, the United Nations. Um, ambassador Nuseba is a, has a long diplomatic career. She's been at the UN for seven years. Uh, before that, uh, again, a, a distinguished career in the diplomatic service of the UAE, including standing up and then being the founding director for three years of the policy planning staff in the UAE foreign ministry. So we're, we're delighted to have you with us. Thanks for making time to be with us virtually. We're looking forward to having you here physically, but uh, we'll, we'll settle for cyber, cyberspace. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, thank you. So let me uh, begin, uh, Madam Ambassador, just with a, uh, I thought what we'd do is we'd have a conversation for about 20, uh, 30 minutes, and then really throw the floor open to our guests. Uh, those of you who are watching this on Zoom, uh, what you should do is use the Q&A function. The chat function won't work, but you should see a little box in the, the bottom center of your screen. It should say, it says Q&A. And what I'll do is I'll moderate those questions as they come in. Uh, let me just begin with how you personally and more and your country are dealing with COVID. So tell us a little bit, if you would, about the UAE and uh, coronavirus. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen. It's really a pleasure to be able to engage with you and the extended size community through this new uh, format that has become very much the norm of how we all operate today. And thank you for asking about my country and my family. As you just witnessed earlier, you saw a, a, a meltdown from a seven-year-old because I hadn't accessed his next online lesson in time and he had missed it. Um, so I think we're all struggling uh, with the impact of managing uh, both stay-at-home uh, careers alongside managing family and household and online uh, teaching. Uh, I've lost a lot of authority in the house recently when my seven-year-old realized that my uh, Singaporean math was not up to the level he expected, such a, a parental authority. Look, I, I think, uh, Dr. Cohen, we've talked about this um, many times. We are uh, facing potentially one of the most difficult periods through this pandemic in modern history. And the way we, as the United Arab Emirates, the country that I represent every day uh, at the United Nations, uh, the way we as a country step up, the way we as families and communities step up, uh, and the way we as an international community step up to this challenge is really going to be one of the most defining uh, moments, I believe, uh, of our time, and certainly defining for uh, the future of international cooperation uh, in the face of such global uh, pandemics. In terms of the UAE, I think that the lessons learned there are uh, fairly um, quick to summarize. Essentially, we uh, had an early focus on testing capacity. Uh, we've tested over 1 million people to date and for a population of about 10 million, uh, that's an extraordinarily high number uh, of, of tests that have been conducted. And we started early. I remember I myself was in China and Japan on UN work uh, in mid-January. And, and in those early days, um, the, the extent of the pandemic was still very much confined uh, to, to Wuhan at the time and other places uh, potentially around the world were not yet realizing the potential impact globally. And I was tested on return to the UAE and that was in mid-January. Uh, so it shows you, I think that the countries that have uh, you know, quickly stepped up capacity on testing have managed to contain potentially the first wave of this pandemic. Having said that, we also know that there will be many waves of this pandemic, and it's important that we don't uh, sit on our laurels and think that the work is done. And that's why, uh, if I could say that there was one thing that the UAE did from the very beginning uh, that for me made me proud to represent my country, it was the number of phone calls that our leadership made, that Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed and Sheikh Hamad bin Rashid and our foreign minister Sheikh Abdullah made uh, to leaders around the world asking what do you need and what can we do? We have uh, limited capacity, but what we have, we will share. 
And I think that notion, that principle of uh, global distribution in the international order is going to be so essential as we move forward to the next phase. So we've helped up to date uh, above 27 countries now in disparate parts of the world, uh, from Africa to Asia uh, to elsewhere. Uh, we've, uh, we've distributed 340 metric tons of PPE and medical supplies. We've helped repatriate uh, tens of thousands of foreign nationals from different parts of the world. Uh, and we have become uh, centrally, and we always have been a logistic uh, hub, obviously, but uh, because of where we sit between Asia and Africa and around the world, but we have uh, become a transit point for the WHO's global appeal of upward of 85% of its medical equipment, cargo, and even staffing. We're now talking to the UN about creating uh, medvac and UN bed uh, possibilities in the UAE for the UN workers who are so desperately going to need support as this pandemic starts hitting what is known as field operations around the world. And you have upward of 40,000 UN staff today who are valiantly maintaining their position uh, in global hotspots in order to make sure, and this is the other, I think, third key pillar of the UAE strategy, in order to make sure that the most vulnerable who will really feel uh, the extent of this pandemic um, more violently than many other communities and groups, although we're all finding it uh, different and unusual. Um, but to make sure that they're really the ones who are at the center of our response. So uh, I think these are some of the strategies that we have undertaken. We were lucky. Um, I don't think this was about special preparedness that we had from other countries and we still have a tough way to go, but we were lucky that we had that testing capacity in the UAE, perhaps because our region has seen uh, various pandemics before, whether it's uh, MERS, uh, before that SARS, and of course uh, we all watched Ebola and its impact on Western Africa in 2014. So I think we were lucky. Uh, I, we understand that this is the first phase, and we also understand that we are all as strong as our weakest link. And I think that's the fundamental foreign policy realization, uh, certainly in terms of how my leadership view this, that the people are really have to be the center of this response, that uh, for example, in the UAE, um, migrant workers, uh, of which uh, there are uh, millions, uh, we are a community of 200 nationalities, and we have a big migrant community, and we are making sure that they are front and center of our testing, uh, of our social and psychological care, of our economic care. Uh, so I think we can't underestimate the extent of this pandemic. We can't overwork, uh, and that's why I think foreign ministries and ministries of health and economy and uh, crisis management operations are really 24-7 today. Um, we were very focused, of course, in the beginning of making sure that our own national citizens around the world uh, were repatriated where they needed to be, particularly those uh, who were undergoing medical treatment abroad. And I think every country did that. The natural response was, how do I protect my own fortress? Uh, but as Yuval Harari correctly said, we can't live in a, a world or network of fortresses. I think uh, we've suddenly realized quite early on that we're all interdependent, that we're all connected, and that we need to help the weakest link in the, in the human chain. Uh, and that that one planet approach, that the health of the planet is interconnected to the health of a citizen or a country, uh, a nation, uh, is really something that has become uh, very important in our foreign policy thinking. So a lot of changes, some of them will need uh, maybe a decade or two decades, history books will be written about this period, there's no doubt. Uh, so it is a, a monumental time, but I think we all want to feel collectively that we did the best we could, and that's how the UAE is certainly trying to behave as a regional and international actor, that we did the best we could for the millions of uh, displaced people around the world, for the most vulnerable communities. There's been a very worrying uptick of increased domestic violence against women uh, in the homes uh, as a result of this pandemic. Women are one of the very vulnerable groups uh, in terms of our protection of migrant workers uh, and their ability to survive this pandemic and flourish. I think these have been our primary focus. I've seen that around the world. I've seen remarkable resilience from countries around the world, countries coming to each other's aid, sharing supply, sharing knowledge and information of the virus. We've only known it for a few months. Uh, it's, a relatively new, it's a relatively new virus. But what it doesn't have on human ingenuity is our capacity to analyze, our capacity to share that information, to learn from the virus and teach each other how to best approach it. And that's why we need a collective response more than ever. Mm. Well, uh, there's a lot uh, to uh, explore there, obviously. I, you know, I will say it's a cliche, but it is true. The UAE does tend to punch above its weight 
um, in a lot of these international issues. I'm, I'm struck, if I understand you correctly, that the basic, that logistic hub, which the UAE really is, I mean, anybody who flies anywhere sooner or later, you're going to pass through um, Dubai or Abu Dhabi, um, is functioning pretty normally, I take it. Is that correct? Uh, it is. I, you know, obviously, like other countries around the world, we've closed uh, the majority of our uh, flights for passengers. But we understood very quickly in the first days, actually, our foreign minister was on the phone with many of his counterparts. And the same request was coming through again and again, please do not close down for cargo. Please maintain routes, access routes through the UAE. We depend on that both to repatriate uh, our citizens, um, but also to move essential medical supplies, PPE, uh, equipment, ventilators around the world. And so uh, Dubai Humanitarian City, of course, has been a long-term uh, hub for UN operations and for NGOs uh, around the world uh, to be able to move equipment and people personnel uh, around. But I think we've increased that capacity. We've focused uh, on that capacity. We've had conversations at a leadership level with the heads of organizations such as the WHO, the WFP, the World Food Program, um, to make sure also that uh, the coming pandemic, and that's going to be a, a pandemic of famine, uh, unfortunately, for many countries around the world, uh, as food supplies diminish uh, and, and normal economic life is unable to resume. Uh, we've tried to make sure that the UAE will remain a place where you can uh, move supplies, move much needed equipment, move personnel. Uh, and I think that's going to be a pillar of our international humanitarian aid strategy. Of course, for a number of years, we've been one of the uh, highest contributors, contributors compared to GNI in terms of our humanitarian aid portfolio. So we continue to um, up that uh, contribution internationally because we think it's important. We've always done it historically, but we think today with the global community about to potentially go into global recession, and the double digit contributions to GDP that's gonna be needed in terms of uh, the uh, monetary institutions and the packages, the financial packages that need to be injected into the economies. Today, more than ever, it is not the time to shut down. It is uh, the time to stay open to our friends, but even to those who potentially we haven't had good relations with in the past. I, I think taking that humanitarian lens that this is about people first, uh, and then narrowing that scope down to it being about the most vulnerable people within those communities, I think is the right foreign policy. I think it's a foreign policy that sits uh, well with us. So I'm gonna come back to some of those themes in a moment. Uh, first though, let me just ask you, um, so what is it like being a diplomat at the UN when you know, you're, uh, there you are working from home and dealing with a seven-year-old who's afraid that he might miss his, I must say he's a very dutiful seven-year-old if he's concerned about missing his homework. That's. I'm used to having seven-year-olds seven year around. They were not usually quite as concerned as, as I think he might have been. I can explain that. I think uh, we don't yet know the psychological impact on children yeah. that staying at home edict yeah. had on uh, their well-being. Uh, and let alone in, again, countries like the U.S., where internet and broadband is fast and accessible and we've all been able to move to virtual classrooms. Think about the countries that are not online. Think about the lost years of education uh, for those children. And, and that's really, again, where all of our focus and priority must be. If you think about being a, a Syrian refugee today when you've already been displaced five times since the Civil War started there and you're in that 10th year of that displacement, think about that, what that means to the lost generation there or in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip or uh, elsewhere around the region, and especially in Africa. Uh, so that element of education, that policy focus on education is really going to be critical. Um, to answer your question, I said against that context of what is happening globally, uh, I think UN, uh, the UN diplomatic community has uh, reverberated quickly and bounced back quickly um, in trying to uh, have business as usual, business continuity. I think the first priority when the World Health Organization declared this a, a global pandemic in, in mid-March, the first priority was really the safety of the teams, both at headquarters in New, New York, 10, 15,000 or so plus families, take that upward of 30,000 in the diplomatic missions, um, making sure that we uh, followed New York State's guidelines uh, on uh, the health of, of the community in New York. I think we all very much feel like New Yorkers in this moment. Uh, 
as New York has gone through quite a particularly challenging time. And we've all tried to help contribute to being a part of that community, which is really where pandemics bring you down to in the most basic sense is that unit of community, that unit of family, uh, being part of your city. Um, and so I think while working at home, while focusing on business continuity, of course, we've seen gaps in our technologies. I think every organization uh, and entity has seen those gaps and tried quickly to rectify those gaps. And after that initial, what I like to call a hush that sort of spread uh, almost like a whisper around the world, it was really quite extraordinary uh, where we all stayed home and then eventually started venturing out in the evening to applaud the health workers uh, in New York. It's at 7 p.m. and it's a, a ritual that my family and I do diligently as, as a member of this community because it's, it's really about feeling that, uh, again, that collectivity that together we can, we can overcome. And I don't think there's been uh, a sentiment like this, as I've said, since potentially in the West, World War II, the end of World War II, it's really that kind of a defining moment. So we've uh, managed to keep UN business moving uh, surprisingly well. We've adapted well to working from home. Of course, embassies were set up in the Renaissance period so that diplomats could be on, on the ground speaking and engaging with their interlocutors. So we are social creatures by training. And I think that's been a very difficult part of some of the negotiations that we've tried uh, to continue. Even if it's online, it's often stilted. You don't have that moment for the diplomatic aside at a reception where you hear a piece of interesting information or you're able to come to a compromise on a resolution uh, by finding that middle ground. We've essentially, through this pandemic, lost the middle ground of diplomacy for a while and we're all struggling uh, to regain it as we move to Zoom meetings and so forth. Um, or Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, the most common phrase right now at the UN when you start a meeting is if you're not speaking, please mute your microphone. Uh, and it's uh, <laughs> an extraordinary time. And, um, but we've managed to, the Security Council uh, managed to adopt provisional pr procedures in order to continue with its, with its uh, work, renewing the mandates of peace operations in uh, Darfur and Somalia, for example. The General Assembly has passed two resolutions um, promoting a global approach to tackling the pandemic. Of course, COVID-19 very much is paramount in most countries' minds as we try to think about what we need to navigate next. For my own process that I uh, oversee, the intergovernmental negotiations on Security Council reform, it has been difficult uh, to, to move forward without that uh, situational physicality of being together. Uh, so I think that this is uh, pushing us all to be far more creative diplomats uh, than we have been uh, in the past. Uh, so for example, you know, I think this is what everyone did, but we all check on each other regularly. We make sure our community is doing okay. Uh, we have Zoom calls with, with each other to find out uh, what different processes we can move forward. And I think the framework uh, in which we're all operating today is how do we make sure that the UN is operational um, when this pandemic hits the most hard pressed places around the world? How do we make sure those field operations are able to function? How do we make sure uh, that peacekeeping operations are able to, to do their work? Uh, and you know, it struck me when I was having a conversation with, with the UN Medical uh, Division recently who do some incredible work uh, protecting UN operations around the world, that with the uh, Ebola crisis in 2014, of course, it was the field that was impacted uh, mostly in Western Africa, but UN headquarters was up and running and operational and able to direct and send cables and send reinforcements, if you like, and, and, and create diplomatic uh, products and uh, statements that would support those operations. Today, it's the first time that the UN headquarters itself is down. It's closed. It's been closed since mid-March. So getting that framework up and running again where you know your your preeminent multilateral institution that needs to be the global voice that needs to be uh, the communications voice that needs to keep the field running as it were uh, is a mindset shift which is why we're working so diligently to make sure it doesn't impact on operations but of course as we've seen around the world global events of solidarity around the world have had to be postponed as a result of this we have to be cognizant of that so whether it's the olympics in japan or Expo in Dubai, uh, a dream we've all been working very hard uh, to fulfill for years now. Um, whether it's COP26 and the you know, future discussions of climate change, uh, potentially even the UN General Assembly in September is an open question. Uh, we need to all understand that things will never go back to the same normal that we all uh, remember, that this is a new normal. 
and that we will have to take a very phased approach back into uh, the normality of diplomatic work. And we'll have to understand how that impacts fundamental issues of peace and security, of course. Mm -hmm. And the region where I come from, of course, the, the, the problems haven't got any lesser. Uh, we still have key issues that we need to address, whether it's the rise of extremism and terrorism, and they're well known for exploiting vacuums and uh, opportunities like this one, as they would see it. Uh, and we have to be alert to that. Fractured state systems, uh, countries with really weakened public health systems. We do need to coalesce around helping those systems, whether it's in Yemen, where uh, millions of Yemenis rely on a public health system that has been uh, much weakened uh, over the past decade, uh, whether we look at Syria, whether we look at Libya, again, another fractured uh, state. Uh, and the answers and the solutions in the UAE's point of view all come back to the political process. They all come back to the umbrellas that the UN is charting uh, for political dialogue, which is why I think the Secretary General's call for a ceasefire uh, was so inspired uh, and essential, um, because essentially uh, by stating that in this particular time of pandemic, now is the time to, to put the, the guns down, as it were, and really focus uh, on the health and well being of citizens around the world. Uh, I think that was a brave call. The UAE was proud to join uh, that call and uh, to support others in doing so. These are some of the tools we have in our toolkit as diplomats, um, but we have to, uh, of course, become a little bit more agile and creative uh, as the situation evolves and keep a focus on some of the core priority issues that I know we all collectively think are, are important to our shared future. You know, I, I, uh, I have to think that also that the work that you're describing there must be a, a particular sense of urgency that arises from the fact that you're at the moment in the epicenter of the pandemic. I mean, New York City being hit probably at the moment harder than just about any other place. Although, as you say, you know, there's, there are going to be waves and waves that come at us. And I'm, go I'm going to want to come back to that in a moment. Let me ask you, uh, though, before we do that, uh, so you're on the board of trustees of the Emirates Diplomatic Academy, an institution that I've visited and lectured at, um, and with which we're looking forward to having a, a relationship here at SICE going forward. And you've thought a lot about the education of diplomats. Uh, I'm curious, how do you think that kind of education, and maybe even the kind of education we offer at SICE, will need to change in the wake of this, um, this pandemic? Look, I think um, what we now term as health diplomacy is really going to become a core part of what we do as a foreign service in the same way that perhaps in the past, uh, climate change became a portfolio that foreign ministries had to come up to speed to, or artificial in intelligence and the regulation uh, of, of, of that future technology. Today, I think the future of pandemics, uh, the existence of pandemics as part of our modern age is going to be a fundamental part of what diplomats need to be uh, up on, that they need to be communicating with each other on and with their counterparts around the world. And you know, this really matters because if the global system breaks, uh, if we are not able to share the resources, uh, and of course it's absolutely natural, as I said, that a sort of nationalization uh, of a response to COVID-19 was the initial first reaction. Uh, but I think many countries like us then stepped up and understood that a regional response and then an international response would mean that down the line, when the other phases come, uh, there's also self-interest in it as well as a global good. Down the line, those countries would have your back as well, that there is uh, a sense, there's a logic in uh, sharing the global resource to combat this thing. Because even if you manage to get your uh, reinfection rate down to below one, which New Zealand has impressively done, 0.4, I believe, uh, they announced today. Uh, as soon as you open up your airports or someone comes in, you've effectively opened up the channels uh, for, for the disease to be retransmitted. So as I said at the, be at the beginning, we are as strong as our weakest link. Now, what I think we've seen in the response at the beginning, and I think this is where we now as diplomats need to work collectively to ensure we strengthen, is that we have our, of course, our World Health Organization that's done some really important work in being the global face and global voice of this response in addition to national governments. Uh, but essentially the multilateral system today uh, doesn't have the teeth that it needs uh, to make these 
recommendations that they give to countries binding. And I think that's been by the choice of nations. We all value our sovereignty. That's been uh, an es essential part of the, of the nature and, and basis of government. Uh, but I think as we move forward, if we can't support um, an international global supply chain management system that essentially says, you know, trust, and I think trust is one of the primary uh, issues that is at stake today, trust in your government, trust in your leadership to protect you as its citizen. And it's a real test of citizenship also in, in many ways. But if that trust can't be recreated for our international mechanisms, our systems to manage global supply chain, then, you know, you could transport um, several million test kits into a country, but find that that country doesn't have uh, the necessary supply of swabs or reagents needed to actually perform the test. Uh, you could send um, medical supplies to a country in terms of PPE, but then find when you get there, as is the case in actually 10 countries in, in Africa today, don't have a single ventilator. Uh, so you've got medics who could receive your PPE, but when the patients get to a critical point, uh, there isn't a ventilator system to put them on. Um, so, you know, there is enough, I think, is the message for everyone but we need to be smart about how we share those resources and how we manage that global supply chain of all of these key, key issue, you know, apparatus right now that is so much in demand and not compete against each other. I think uh, if we collect, we are collective, we're cooperative and we share and we don't compete. When your time comes, because this thing is going to peak and trough in different waves around the world, when your time comes, you need to rely on that international system uh, to then support you as you need. And I think that's one of the messages that uh, our diplomatic community is really focusing on. It's something that our, um, our young diplomats certainly have to be au fait with, which is, which is health diplomacy, which is this is going to be with us uh, for a period of time. Um, you know, as Dr. Henry Kissinger, who's of course a, a dear friend of yours and mine said recently in a Washington Post uh, article, failure to get this right, failure to get this fundamental point right uh, in terms of global cooperation could set the world on fire. So let, let me go with that. Um, of course, what you've sketched out is really, a, it's a different vision of diplomacy in some ways than you know we usually think of. I mean, I, I doubt that Talleyrand or Metternich uh, had, had quite as enlightened a view of multilateralism, uh, although they had their own views of multilateralism. I, I wanna ask you a different kind of question. So you're, um, as I think anybody who's listening to you can tell, somebody who's action-oriented, uh, who's positive, who's optimistic, who, when they see problems, wants to fix them. Uh, but, uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why we get along, your background is as an historian. You were trained at uh, the University of Cambridge, uh, where you got advanced degrees as well as the undergraduate degree. And history usually doesn't make people optimists. Um, it, in any case, gives a certain kind of perspective. And so I'd like, if you could, to step back a bit from the ought, what, what you think needs to be done, but stepping back and putting on your uh, lenses as someone who's historically trained, um, what do you see as some of the real or potential disruptions that are coming our way that we have to deal with? you know, three or four of them, because there's, I think we could, we could spend a whole day on that one. Um, but not, not what we should do, but here's the phenomena that we'll be looking at. So, um, you know, I think actually, I would, I would disagree. I think historians can be optimistic. Um, you know, one of the first things, I think like a lot of people I started doing uh, when this broke out, and you found that there were uh, gaps of time in your schedule in between Zoom meetings or technology failures is you had time to read. And so uh, it was interesting how many people started uh, downloading books about plagues and um, uh, previous pandemics and how societies have, have learned to deal with them in the past and seeing if lessons can be applied to where we are today and to the future. And I essentially think that's what history is, as you know, and many historians attest to history is an understanding of where we are today so we know where we can we, we should move forward in the future and, and what lessons we draw from that um you know I, i'm i'm ashamed i suppose to to throw this in but reading um uh, camus the plague albert camus the plague set in in the 1940s but talking about a pandemic that broke out 
um, in a, a town called Oran uh, in the 1850s, I think it was, um, and, and how the community responded there. There are some very vivid descriptions of emotion and sentiment that could well describe the instinctive human nature today as we face this again, the things that fear uh, and lack of trust create in human beings, I think has been a constant in history. Um, and so learning that, seeing that that is the natural state of the, of the human existence and understanding how to, how to best communicate our way out of that because we know better uh, uh, not, to, um, not to victimize, uh, not to uh, attribute this uh, to one place or one nationality to make sure that uh, the access is equal for all. Um, to understand, as we do in the UAE, that testing should be free and widespread for anyone, not in terms of whether you can afford it or not, but um, uh, whether you need it or not. Um, I think those are some of the lessons that, that history brings to the forefront for us, um, not to be scared of different communities, um, because essentially this, uh, as we've seen with this pandemic, it absolutely is not a racist pandemic. Um, it recognizes uh, no borders, uh, no ethnic groups, no religions. It's been described as the great equalizer, but of course, for the reasons I outlined in the beginning about the most vulnerable groups, different groups will, will face this pandemic in different ways, uh, depending on, on how secure they are in their systems. Um, I think the big lesson uh, also for us is how important the relationship between citizens and their government is today. And of course, again, historically drawing some, some of those lessons, that has always been uh, the case. These are situations that test the very notion of your social contract between yourself and your, your, your government, your community leader, your religious leader. Uh, and that has been, I think, the key drawing from this whole pandemic, that you need uh, to make sure there is not a trust deficit between your population and your leadership so that um, everything is, of course, evidence-based in terms of the policy decisions that you make, but then that you communicate that clearly because you're asking people and individuals and societies to undertake some pretty radical steps in order to protect the group. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's not at all a, a utilitarian view of uh, let's just do whatever's the best for the many. It's really, no, every individual in this society counts and we need to protect the most vulnerable, particularly the elderly in this situation. Um, so I think those are some of the lessons. The trust, uh, the trust deficit has to be you know, narrowed, not only in uh, national governments, but also in the multilateral system. And I'll come back to that again. You know, it, World War II was a defining moment that created the Bretton Woods institutions that we're now relying on today to talk about both the health response, which of course is the primary uh, starting point for this crisis, is get everyone safe. But then of course, talk about the future uh, economic and political and social response, which are going to be critical to making sure uh, that people actually survive this, um, even if they've lost their jobs uh, as they are doing around the world and they don't have access to income and food. So I go back to that, the Brenton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the uh, trillion dollar packages that they're encouraging governments around the world to think about um, the, um, the uh, debt relief approach uh, that is being discussed by the G20 under Saudi Arabia's uh, leadership amongst other uh, groupings. These are all really essential steps that we need to take now. I think the other lesson that we learned from history that is that it's very easy to panic in a crisis, respond quickly, take a, a bunch of measures, and then as soon as the crisis abates, relax a little bit and think, um, you know, we, we can relax until the next time we're okay. And I think if we were to draw another lesson from this is let's look at the historical trajectory of this. Let's look at the history of pandemics. Let's look at SARS, MERS, H1N1, Ebola, and now COVID-19. And let's understand that this is really part of our, uh, our global community today. This is a reality of our global community today. And let's prepare better. I, I think every country could say today, I did some things right, even in the UAE, but I did some things wrong. Uh, I could have done, I could have been a little bit faster with this. I could have been a little bit uh, more proactive on that. Um, you know, and that was the tough decisions many governments were taking around the world. Do we close down and impact our economies? Is that cost too high? Or uh, do we protect the health of every single individual? I think those are some of the lessons um, that could be learned. Um, you know, interestingly, we were having a discussion with the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, yesterday uh, in one of our groupings. And he was talking very much about understanding the future of multilateral, multilateralism as much more networked today uh, 
uh, than we've ever understood it before. But by that, we have to understand that the innovation solutions for this isn't just going to come from government. It's going to come from government. It's going to come from the private sector. Look today at what the big private sector companies are doing, what the Bill Gateses and uh, others, the NGO communities, the frontline health workers are doing in response to this. Um, if you look to the startup labs uh, in San Francisco uh, today and the work on vaccines being done in all the top institutions around the United States and also in Europe, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, that approach of a networked multilateralism is going to be more critical than ever, which is understanding that the solutions lie in these partnerships, these partnerships between government, people, citizens, the media. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a much more networked approach than I think we've ever been used to in government. It's certainly going to impact the way we look at diplomacy, but it is the only way we can all move collectively out of this. And of course, I think on those things, on vaccine development and on uh, the global supply chain for PPE, we need to approach this as a global public good. I think that's essential as we move forward. Um, it's good to have the competition. It's good to race for the vaccine, to be the company in the country that produce it. But then we need to scale up how we supply it. We need to be ambitious about getting every single person in the future, in the next two to three years, vaccinated, uh, including the most vulnerable and especially the most vulnerable who are living in uh, refugee camps uh, and very difficult, challenging conflict zones around the world. You know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad you... Uh... You mentioned Camus' The Play, because the, 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 that was the first book that I found, <laughs> found myself rereading um, when this began. And it's, uh, it is an extraordinarily powerful novel, and it's partly an allegory about the occupation of France, but it is very much a, a book about plague. And what's haunting is that at the end, he says, look, the plague will always return. And, and if you don't learn its lessons, and so there's a there's a kind of chill at the end of that novel by a man who was quite a deep thinker yes. uh, about our world. Um, let me ask one last question before I throw things open uh, to, um, to the Q and A. Um, you know, I can easily imagine things going in different directions. I can imagine, uh, you know, the kind of future that you described where people look out for one another much more, where there's really much more universal um, availability of the things that you need to deal with a crisis like this, but I can also imagine greater uh, inequality. I mean, even, you know, you mentioned earlier on the United States um, with broadband. Well, not everybody in the United States has access to broadband uh, or reliable broadband or broadband that's adequate for, say, teaching children at home. Um, and so there's, you know, the, the, the cost, if we don't do some of those things, I, I agree with you, could be very high. The question I wanted to pose to you is how has this crisis um, affected, in your view, American leadership in the world? Look, I, you know, I think that there, there's a very compartmentalized approach in governments right now, which is let's focus on the pandemic because it's here. Uh, and that's certainly the very practical um, cooperation that we've been having with the United States since this broke out. Uh, and, you know, I, I know you know Ambassador Yusuf in Washington well, and you know he is um, a, a foreign policy pillar of our uh, US UAE bilateral relationship, which is an incredibly important one to us and remains uh, that way, particularly because the US, at least in our part of the world, uh, is keeping its eye on the ball of other things that could uh, develop and disintegrate in the face of this void and this vacuum. And I think that's really important to also keep an eye on. Uh, you don't want, um, you know, civil war to break out again in different uh, countries. We've been very focused on helping the Secretary General get people to commit to the global ceasefire in Libya and Yemen. Uh, and we've seen uh, various parties break that in the previous month. And it's been very important to work with the U.S. Uh, and others in the international community, particularly some of the Europeans, in reinforcing that message that now more than ever, we need to protect those public health systems, we need to protect those populations, those vulnerable populations. So having a partner like the US with that strategic depth to be able to manage what is essentially a domestic crisis in every country in the world, but also keep an eye on the ball of what is happening uh, in terms of geostrategy in our region and elsewhere, I think is really, really critical. And not very many countries have that depth. They've had to 
uh, repurpose all of their um, ability to, to coping with the pandemic quite naturally. And we've had to do a fair deal of that ourselves. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's the first point I'd like to make. I think the second point I'd like to make, um, you know, and we're a big believer in uh, the US's very valuable and positive role it plays in the global stage. Uh, that's been something that's been very key in our part of the world. At the same time, we recognize uh, that there are new and emerging and powerful players uh, that also would like a say in the post-World War II order that was set up in 45 that doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the biggest economies and the biggest population figures uh, around the world. And that maybe this more network multilateralism uh, with other uh, countries coming in uh, at the table is not a bad thing for how we reshape the world order. Uh, going forward. So I think essentially uh, we all need uh, a U.S., a strong U.S. presence at the table, not just in the response to this, but in the economic response internationally, um, in the political response, in this peace and security response. Uh, we all need that, and we're certainly talking uh, with the United States very closely about the priorities that we're concerned about, and I'm sure they're having those conversations um, globally. Let's not forget also that some of the most innovative science and educational institutes are in the United States. Uh, so, you know, uh, in addition to places around the world, that collaboration between the scientist community, between the epidemiologists, uh, between the uh, infectious disease experts is going to be more critical than ever. And I've sat in on a number of calls listening to U.S. doctors talk to Italian doctors, understanding from them what uh, how the disease evolved, how the virus evolved in the worst struck places in Italy, for example, and what lessons could be brought to bear in the US response. Uh, and it's been a privilege listening to those conversations because those communities, those networked communities globally um, of the best minds uh, internationally uh, is gonna be essential for all of us to get through this. Part of that solution is going to be in China with their exceptional understanding of the virus, um, their data, their information sharing, um, their central point in the global uh, supply chain. Um, so I think, you know, and I think I'm getting to the point of your question, which is uh, no one, I think, from the smaller and medium-sized countries like us want to see a new Cold War emerge uh, between the U.S. and China or the U.S. and anywhere else in the world. We, we all understand the, the very vital role the U.S. plays on the global, uh, on the global stage, and we're supporting that. Yeah. So um, uh, I could keep on going for forever, but we only have 15 minutes left. Um, I'm going to pick and choose from a number of the uh, questions which have been coming in, and I apologize to those of you that I'm not going to be able to get to. Um, let me, uh, and I'll reserve the right to reframe them slightly. Um, of course, the UA is a very globalized country, and uh, you know, you look out at Africa and South Asia, as well as at uh, the Gulf area in the Middle East. But let me ask you a question that is about uh, the region, and that is, in particular, um, how you think uh, the pandemic is affecting uh, the relationship between Iran and its neighbors. Just you know, where is that now, and how does COVID affect it? I have to say, one of the things that really strikes me is it's clear that COVID is hitting Iran, but nobody really knows, as far as I can tell, just how how hard. But maybe you could speak to that a bit. Mm -hmm. Look, I, you know, I think that the um, the approach we've taken that I outlined in the beginning has been through the perspective of a human security lens, and that includes Iran. So essentially, uh, the well-being, the health of the Iranian population is interlinked and connected to our well-being and health as the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and the region. Iran is a uh, historical part of the region. Uh, there are cultural ties that go back hundreds of years with our country. Uh, there are political ties and so forth. Um, that's, of course, notwithstanding some of the political issues uh, that your audience is well, well versed on in terms of their regional behavior. But I think the lens that we approached Iran with, like all other countries that we've helped, and we've helped countries in, a very, di in very diverse continents uh, that have needed it, has also been through that human lens. So Iran was one of the early countries that we sent uh, medical supplies and equipment to. Uh, we have had check-in conversations with them from a health perspective uh, to see if there's anything that we could do uh, as the UAE. Um, and of course, we've had conversations about 
uh, their community living in the UAE and um, whether they require any repatriation uh, assistance. So I think that is the lens that we're looking at Iran today. That is the lens that we are looking at all countries in the region, all players in the region, um, because we understand that this is the first priority of business today. It can't be anything else. And if we allow um, geopolitical differences to influence that response, uh, then I think uh, we're, never, uh, we're, we're never surviving uh, this shipwreck. Um, and we're all in that same boat. I think that's how we're, we're viewing it. Of course, at the same time, conversations are um, ongoing about some of the uh, security issues. It's not like the pandemic wipes all those issues and that slate clean, as it were. Um, you know, so there are obviously ongoing uh, concerns. There is ongoing monitoring of the situation. There's a desire to de-escalate and find uh, the political way forward uh, to some of the uh, activity in the region that we've had such an issue with for so many years. But today, uh, I can say that um, our foreign minister is in the mode of checking in, making sure that the people uh, in Iran and around the world uh, where we've been trying to help are okay. Do you see changes in the Iranian outlook that are um, commensurate with what you're talking about? That is to say, you know, you, you've indicated basically that the UAE's uh, diplomatic priorities really are now oriented fundamentally around COVID. Do you see that coming out of Iran or perhaps other actors in the region, or is it kind of one more thing that people are, are factoring into their existing policies? No, it's really interesting. I think that citizens in all these countries, including Iran, including in the region, are going to be holding their governments uh, to account and around the world in a way that hasn't existed before. This whole uh, test of citizenship, if you like, is really going to be what defines the future foreign policy of a country. And I think that's going to be a very personal, uh, a personal thing in each country. I know that in my country, testing, uh, trust in government was high. It's gone even higher. Uh, you know, in the last five years in the region, uh, Arab youth, and we have a large Arab youth demographic in our region, um, have for five years always said that the UAE, they voted the UAE as the number one place they would like to live and work and reside, uh, even given an international choice menu, if you like, um, because it's a place to come to prosper, to thrive, uh, to be in an Arab country, to be in a, a Muslim country that uh, uh, embraces other faiths and religions. Um, I think that that trust level, that trust barometer has gone even higher today, and that's extraordinary. Um, and I think that that is going to be the case for some countries in the region, but it's not going to be the case necessarily in others. So I would say this uh, to all governments um, around the world, and this is how I see it as a diplomat sitting here, understanding uh, how governments are responding and how citizens are responding. This is really the time for governments uh, to, uh, to redefine, if you like, that social contract with their citizens and prove to them that they are there for their well-being, their security, their health, um, that these are their priorities. And I think that's what is happening. So I would say in Iran, like with, else, with other countries around the region, uh, governments will be held to account for what they do today to protect not just their citizens, but their residents and their uh, international community residing in that country. No, I, I think that's right. Uh, and of course, it can play out in all kinds of different ways. Uh, let me take a, a question that's about diplomacy and tweak it a little bit. Um, you know, we're all getting used to using Zoom. Uh, I've even begun doing some teaching online, which I have to confess I never quite expected to do, and find it works pretty well. And I wonder if in the world of diplomacy too, after everybody gets used to uh, services like this, which have a kind of clarity and effectiveness and reliability, which are comparable to you know, the best classified things that I saw when I was in government uh, uh, more than a decade ago, people will say, well, actually, why do we need so many diplomats hanging around in person? Why can't we do diplomacy much more capital to capital using technologies like this, which will get even better, which will really get closer to uh, the kinds of virtual reality things that until now we've just seen in the movies. But won't diplomacy in some fundamental way be changed? Because, you know, you, as you said, as a good historian, that modern diplomats kind of grow out of the Renaissance, the idea of having somebody permanently in another capital to observe, to report, to interpret, uh, to communicate. 
is technology rendering some of that approach to diplomacy fundamentally obsolete? Yeah, I think you touch on all the right questions that diplomats and foreign services have to be asking today. Um, and not only um, in terms of what has changed that maybe we don't want to go back to um, in, in the way we do business. I certainly know that, again, going back to my seven-year-old, um, the silver lining of corona for, for him has been twofold. One has been the amount of time he's now spending uh, with his parents overseeing his, uh, his online learning. Of course, he misses his friends, but the amount of time has been a, uh, a massive boon of the pandemic. Uh, and the second thing, and I think a lot of children feel that way, and if you think about the kinds of global movements have, that have been inspired around climate change, um, he's really been relieved to understand that the impact for uh, wildlife species and animals and the planet around the world has been net net positive. I mean, that's been for him, uh, you know, his delight is watching the YouTube clips of, you know, goats running across the streets or um, uh, taking over the highways or visiting each other in the zoo and dolphins coming back in the canals of Venice and so forth. Um, and, you know, it does, uh, watching how children have responded um, to, uh, to this pandemic, of course, my, uh, my nine month old is oblivious as long as the food keeps coming in. Um, but watching how children have responded really helps you put your finger on some of the critical questions we need to ask ourselves going forward. And one of them is to use another uh, expression of the Secretary General, do we want to come back and rebuild better? Uh, and, you know, I think that's a really big question because we already know that this um, virus was zoonotic, that it moved, uh, transmitted from, from animal to, uh, to human and then human to human. And of course, that begs the question of, you know, do we need a one health approach today uh, of both the planet uh, and ourselves as a human species? And can we manage to bring about the international uh, will needed for that approach. Uh, and that's really the question that my, my seven-year-old makes me think about all the time. I was reading in the New York Times today, the Secretary General wrote an op-ed citing uh, recent data produced by the International Renewable Energy Agency, which is headquartered in Abu Dhabi, a multilateral agency focused on the future of renewable energy. Um, and that report showed that $98 trillion would be added to uh, the global economy if we built, rebuilt the economy in a greener way. And we now have that, if you like, blank page to do that. We could rebuild greener. We could look at greener investments. We could look uh, at greener opportunities in terms of the job market uh, and what we recreate in, in, in those packages. So it's really a question to think about is, despite the havoc caused and the really untimely deaths uh, and the, um, the sadness that those deaths bring, is there potentially an opportunity, an opening for diplomats to understand and for governments and uh, public health systems to come together and say, how do we do this better the next time around? I, I really hope that's the question uh, that we'll all be tackling alongside our immediate response to the pandemic. On your second point on technology, I think it's critical. Um, you know, imagine um, students around the world today being able to attend SICE, as it were, um, from, a from a country in Africa or in Asia because um, they didn't necessarily have the means or the wherewithal to get to, to Washington to attend that. Look at this conversation that we're having. Given busy schedules, it might have taken months yeah. to get me to Washington to do this in person. I'm now able to do it uh, quite happily um, through, this, through this virtual medium. Um, so there are some innovations. I do want to add one word of caution, though, around the technology, and I think that's another area that diplomats and government officials need to be thinking about very carefully, which is we also know that part of the response to the pandemic, the effective response, is going to be through what is known as contact tracing, uh, uh, potential technological surveillance uh, of citizens who've contracted the disease and uh, being able to know who they've uh, been in contact with. And that is all for the good uh, in the first initial phase of the response to the pandemic. But we have to also decide as a global community, uh, and again, different countries are racing towards their own technological solutions to this. We need to decide as a global community what kind of norms we want to regulate that, potentially for the future of, of privacy and citizenship. And these are important issues that emerge, particularly are put into sharper focus because of this pandemic. Yeah. You know, I um this is terrible. You know, I um I'm I'm running out of time. We're also getting a bit of an echo here. Um, 
you know, I think the it is going to be interesting and extraordinarily important how uh, children and teenagers at this moment who will be seared by this experience, I mean, this will be something that they will remember uh, in a variety of ways, will then react to it. You know, we know that whether it's the experience of the Depression or World War II or 9-11, it has a generation-level impact. It has a generation-level impact. And I think we will see that. Um, we I don't think we'll see that. Another question. Uh, we don't have another question. I, I want to uh, thank you very much for being our virtual guest. And I just want to say how much we look forward to having you as our actual guest at some point back here in Washington, D.C. So Ambassador Nuseba, thank you very much. And I apologize to those who didn't have a chance to ask a question. We'll look forward to uh, having another session like this a little bit further down the road. Thank you very much. I look forward to it too, Elliot. Always good to see you and be well and stay safe. You too. Be well. Take care.